And I need to begin tonight by making a correction. Two weeks ago, on our maiden broadcast on the Genesis Communications Network, I began by talking about what a libertarian America would be like, what a, what a country we would have with more liberty, how repealing the income tax would give us the money to put our children in private schools or start a business or contribute to our favorite causes or charities or churches in a much better way than we can now, and how if we could be freed from Social Security, we could take much better care of our finances and our old age, and how if we got rid of the drug war, we would be able to have... a city that was much safer and schools that were safer and so forth. But in the course of all this, I was trying to make the point that in every case, whatever the social problem, whatever the situation that seems to need improvement, the answer is always more liberty. Not less liberty, not more government, but more liberty, which means less government, smaller government. And in the process of that, I made the mistake of saying that I believe we will have more crime in America when we have greater liberty in America. Obviously, (laughs) I meant to say, I believe we will have less crime in America when we have greater liberty in America. Because what we have today is a federal government that is imposing all sorts of things on police forces around the country. Oh, yes, they do it by handing out the bait of federal funds for law enforcement, and they pass bills that are supposedly going to put 100,000 more cops on the street. But really, what those bills do is enforce all kinds of federal rules, racial quotas, whatever it may be, and they inevitably wind up with many of those 100,000 cops uh, doing work that has nothing to do with law enforcement. But in fact, you don't even get the 100,000 cops. Uh, Bill Clinton promised that many, many years ago, and they still haven't gotten all those 100,000 cops into the local police forces. Uh, The drug war is another example where, because we have less liberty, our police forces are running around catching people who are smoking marijuana. Our courts are sentencing them to 10, 20, 30 years in prison. The prisons are overloaded with people who smoke marijuana or sell it but are doing no violence to other people. And the result is that murderers, rapists, and child molesters get out on plea bargain or early release because the prisons are so overcrowded. We have the largest prison population in the world, and it certainly has not made us safer. In fact, that large prison population has made us less safe. What happens as a byproduct of that, of course, is that people who are nonviolent go into that violent setting of a federal prison or a state prison, and they come out as violent individuals, and they no longer have any respect for the law, and they no longer have any respect for other people because they've been living in the law of the jungle in the prison, and so now we have more criminals on the street than we had before those people went in. The point is, of course, that liberty is the answer. Government is never the answer. Whatever the social problem, whatever it is you believe must be done, The only way it's going to get done is through some private voluntary effort. And if that seems like too much work, so be it. If it seems like too much work to rally other people to do this, to persuade other people that this is how they should act, to persuade other people to put up the money for the program that you want, if that seems like too much work, so be it. The other way, going to the government to get it, is impossible. You may even get the bill passed to create the program with the government, but you will not get whatever it is you wanted from this program in the first place. You will not get safer streets by getting a law passed. You will not get better education by getting a law passed. You will not get better health care by getting a law passed. The whole history of government is a history of failure. I don't care whether you're talking about bringing peace to the world or making families better or whatever it may be. You are not going to get it from the government. All the government knows how to do is to take from some people and give to others. All the government knows how to do is to enforce the way of those who are politically connected. It does not know how to do anything constructive, and it has no record of ever having done anything constructive. And if you believe it has, then call me tonight. Well, let's uh, see what's on the mind of Joe in Virginia tonight. Joe, you going to give us a government program that's been successful? (laughs) Well, you know, I know this is not the uh, financial show, Harry, but uh, after watching the Olympics uh, this past week, I want to know your opinion of Athens Municipal Bond. Athens. (laughs) Yeah, I would say that they're uh, triple F. (laughs) Um, you know, it's interesting. I heard the figure the other day on the radio, and I can't think what it was, but it was something like $8 billion. It was up in the billions of dollars that the Olympics were going to cost the Greek taxpayers. Now, you may remember that in 1984, the Olympics were held in Los Angeles, and it was the only time, to the best of my knowledge, that they have ever been privately financed. Not one dollar of municipal or uh, state taxpayer money went into them unless it was for police outside the Olympic Village. You know, extra police that might have been necessary in the approaches to the Olympic Village, but everything in the Olympics itself was financed privately through the sale of corporate sponsorships. And my goodness, did those corporate sponsorships get worked over in the press. Oh, isn't this terrible? 
uh, commercializing this great Olympic athletic uh, achievement uh, competition and so forth and so on. Isn't it terrible having McDonald's logos around and so forth? Yeah, how much better it would have been to have the people of Los Angeles p paying for this for the rest of their lives. Well, I saw a, a laudatory news account of the Olympics. Now that people are, are starting to stream in a little, little bit, and, and uh, the newscaster did say that the, the people of Athens are going to be able to keep all these things, like the baseball park. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, my, my God, I think... Yeah, and don't, don't forget the beach volleyball court. Exactly. Yes. Well, I wanted to call you about something that I read. Um, I guess I'm like a lot of people. I think... Uh, I think I know a lot, but <laughs> I don't. don't. we all? I, I don't. You know, I became a libertarian 25, about 25 years ago. I just happened to pick up a book by Ayn Rand, and that led me on a trip that got me here, being a very, very serious believer in capitalism and liberty and constitutional government and a big fan of yours to boot. And, um, uh, however, it is amazing to me how, how often I find out things that I didn't know about how uh, pervasive uh, government can be in its ability to corrupt uh, not only American uh, morals, uh, the concept of neighborliness, uh, just how they can corrupt our, our, our whole lives. And there was an article in the New Yorker a few months ago about how the tax code um, corrupts um, the economy. And specifically, and I'd like you to talk about this, and maybe you can really uh, put a good spin on it, um, after, oh, this is, this is a no-spin zone. Well, okay, after I'm the war... I'm the show after O'Reilly. Go ahead, I'm sorry. That's all right. After World War II, um, suburban malls all of a sudden started popping up. And um, I think to most people, and certainly to me, this just seemed like one of the things that happened after the war. They just started popping up all over the place uh, shortly after the war, here and there. And this is one of the things. That people were coming home. They wanted the latest thing, and they wanted to be modern. And the mall was one of the most modern things, you know, an indoor shopping center was just one of the greatest things we could have. Well, I read the New Yorker, this was from March, but you can read a 50-year-old New Yorker and get great information, I think. And, and in 1954, Congress passed a, a law that, um, that made a great deal of difference uh, in, in allowing people to build shopping malls. And what they did was really turn the economy upside down. They made a radical change in tax rules governing depreciation. Now, I'm just going to quote very briefly here. Under tax law, if you build an office building or buy a piece of machinery for your factory or, making, or make any capital purchase for your business, that investment is assumed to deteriorate and lose some part of its value from wear and tear every year. Right. Result, and, and for people who don't understand how depreciation works, when you buy a big piece of equipment for your business, say it costs you $20,000, you cannot deduct the $20,000 in the current year. You have to deduct it over a period of years because it is assumed to have, say, a 10-year life, in which case straight-line depreciation would mean you deduct $2,000 each year for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. There's accelerated depreciation where you can deduct maybe 5000 the first year and 4000 and so on down the line until you've deducted the whole 20000 and so on. But the point is that this is a very critical thing to business because it affects how much tax they're going to have to pay. So when the government changes the rules for certain people, not all, but for certain people, and says you can depreciate this stuff much faster, then there is an incentive for people to get into that particular business because it's, it makes the tax uh, load on them much, much lighter in the short term than it would be if they had to follow the regular rules without the exemption. Now go ahead. Specifically, that, that, that's exactly what, what I was going to say. Uh, what, what Congress did in the mid-50s, uh, they, they wanted to stimulate investment in manufacturing, and they wanted to accelerate, and what they did was accelerate the depreciation process for new construction. And, and using that and other tax loopholes, um, mall developers just went haywire. It didn't make any difference if they made money or lost money. In fact, they preferred to lose money because the money on a loss was not considered income. Uh, it was considered return on investment, and it was tax-free. Yes, and it, may, and it may be that they lost money on a tax basis, but actually came out very well in uh, in the real world, in real regards. But the you have to, to make it, it, yeah. The whole point to make it really simple is that rather than have a very simple tax system, to have this very confusing, complicated uh, system where Congress can change the rules at any time, and for, they do for some people. For the people who are favored, for the people who are the friends of the politicians. But, Joe, you're missing the whole point. These people in Washington know much better what is good for the country than we do. They know what should be built and what shouldn't be built. They know what, what kind of equipment we need and what we don't need and so on. And that's why we have them up there to tell us how to run our lives. Thanks so much for the call, Thank Joe. You, always glad to hear from you. Uh, Matthew in Salt Lake City says, Do you think if we were to change our voting system to runoff voting, where candidates are voted on in order of preference, it would give third parties a greater chance of winning? 
Yes, Matthew, I believe that it would. Uh, runoff voting is where you actually specify when there are two or more, uh, three or more candidates, you specify which one is your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, and the computer uh, figures out that if nobody gets a majority on the first go-around, then it automatically eliminates the bottom one, and whoever voted for it then goes to his second choice, and then if that doesn't produce a majority, they cut off another one from the bottom, and whoever voted for that person, their second choice is taken and so forth, and it goes on that way. Matthew goes on, now that computer voting machines are becoming available, this system would be much more feasible. Do you think there is any chance of this system being put in place in the United States? And my answer to that, Matthew, is absolutely no chance whatsoever. The Republicans and Democrats run the show, and they like the system the way it is. Republicans don't like to see Democrats in the White House or controlling Congress, and Democrats don't like to see Republicans in the White House or controlling Congress. But as long as there's just the two of them, each of them always has a 50-50 chance. Give more power to third parties, and you change the system considerably, and you also open the door to the possibility of major change taking place in the United States, not just the slight cosmetic change that occurs when Democrats replace Republicans or Republicans replace Democrats, but really a wholesale change, such things as repealing the income tax or getting you free from Social Security entirely or things of that sort. And that is something that Republicans and Democrats don't want because the money they are getting now, the $2.4 trillion, which of course will continue to rise year after year, is money that they can use to reward their friends and punish their enemies. So the answer is not to try to work unrealistically at this point for a system that isn't going to come about. What we have to do is to build support for the kind of world that we want, the kind of America we want. And we have to build uh, the libertarian movement in general, the libertarian party specifically, in order to be able to overcome the enormous legal barriers. And as we get bigger, more barriers will be put in our way. But the bigger and bigger we become, the harder and harder it will become for Republicans and Democrats to maintain the status quo. And at some point down the line, when we really do have the ability to change things, we then may be able to change to a more realistic voting system, and we may be able to make the changes without even getting that more realistic voting system. That's the way I see it, Matthew. Uh, Bob, out there in cyberspace, sent me an email saying, it seems that the Republicans are floating the idea of a national sales tax. What are your ideas related to a national sales tax or a flat tax? Well, I have to uh, say that the national sales tax is just one more scam being perpetrated by a political party. <clears throat> they have had control of Congress for 10 years now, and about eight years ago they held some very, very brief and meaningless hearings on changing the income tax code to either a national sales tax or a flat tax, and that was the end of that. Now they have had the White House and the Congress for the last four years, and they have done nothing during those four years to promote the idea of changing the tax code in any substantial material way. But there's an election coming up. Oh, my goodness, what a coincidence. And gee whiz, it looks like a dead heat between the candidates for president. So now we need something really revolutionary to propose. Hey, I think we should get rid of the national income tax and the IRS, and wouldn't that be nice? And if this thing floats very far during this campaign, can you imagine how far it's going to go once Bush is reelected and the Republicans retain control of Congress? That's right. It will go nowhere at all. And even if they did actually seriously consider it, what would they do first? Well, first of all, they've got to exempt the poor from the sales tax. Oh, and then they've got to exempt the favorite industries, you know, uh, whoever it is that sells something that uh, needs to be exempted from the sales tax so that it doesn't become too expensive and has, in fact, an edge over other products so that people will buy the favored products rather than other products in general. And uh, there will be other industries and products and so forth, and uh, naturally we'll have to exempt food and medicine because those things fall more heavily on the poor and so on. So even though they're talking about maybe a 15% sales tax, by the time they get done exempting all their friends and so on, in order to replace the amount of money being collected now by the income tax, they will need oh, a 30% sales tax. How likely is that to be enacted? What's that you say? Not very likely at all? I agree with you. The Cato Institute in Washington, a semi-libertarian think tank, which is uh, in favor of a national sales tax, is actually proposing a 30% tax because they are honest enough to recognize exactly what will happen. But they think a 30% sales tax would be better than the current national income tax. I really think we can sell people more easily on repealing the income tax altogether by getting government out of a sufficient number of programs. That's a more likely possibility than changing the tax code. Well, the government, of course, makes us safer. George Bush never fails to remind us that we are a safer nation today because of all the wonderful things that he and his minions are doing. 
But I'm afraid that a week or so ago, four screeners for the Transportation Security Administration, you know, that new agency that George Bush uh, inaugurated to make us safer, four screeners from the TSA were arrested at Kennedy Airport and LaGuardia Airport for stealing money, jewelry, and other valuables from checked bags. According to an article in the New York Times by James Bobard, the agents were caught in a sting operation after a torrent of complaints about luggage thefts. But unfortunately, these arrests likely represent only a fraction of the abuses nationwide. Bobard goes on to say that in April, four agents in Detroit were arrested for stealing laptop computers, cameras, and other items from checked luggage. In June, four agents were arrested at the Fort Lauderdale Airport on charges of stealing cameras, laptop computers, perfume. Ah, uh, yes, we need the perfume to make America safer. CD players and money. Also in June, a screener was arrested in Philadelphia for stealing $335 from a passenger passing through his checkpoint. And 13 screeners were arrested in New Orleans on charges of stealing valuables from checked luggage. And on and on it goes. Of course, in a situation like this, uh, Bobard points out that the possibilities for mischief are considerable. Congress requires the transportation agency to check all airline baggage with bomb detection machinery or with handheld bomb detectors. More than $5 billion has been spent by the government and airports to purchase and install the new equipment. Gosh, I wonder where the $5 billion came from. Unfortunately, the machines are unreliable. In 2002, Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta told Congress that the machines have a false positive rate of 35%, and if a bag tests positive, it must be searched by hand. To do this, agents routinely examine baggage in closed areas far from prying eyes. Well, there are a lot more things you can say about that. I can tell you from my own experience how ridiculous this is. I fly out of the Nashville, Tennessee airport, fortunately, it's, uh, things are a lot better in Nashville than they are in many other cities around the country. And I always have the same things on my person. For some strange reason, I always carry a certain, the same amount of change, the same uh, wristwatch, of course, and uh, the other things in my pockets. And I empty all those things out in advance. I very often wear the same suits to travel in. So, and I always wear the same shoes. So I am always the same person going through the metal detector. And I never know from one time to the next whether that thing is going to beep. And if I say, you know, I just went through the same metal detector yesterday and it didn't beep and now today it's beeping, the guard will always say, oh, no, 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 these things are calibrated according to federal standards and so forth. They are always exactly the same. And sometimes I go on two, uh, two legs of a flight and have to leave the security area for some reason at an airport along the way and go back through it, meaning that I've gone through two different metal detectors the same day with the same things in my pocket and so on, same clothes on, and it beeps in one and not in the other. And I point this out to the guard and the guard says, no, no, they're all calibrated by federal standards and so on, that can't happen. Well, of course, I must be an idiot for thinking that it happened. Let me tell you another little story. Right after 9-11, I went through a metal detector, and I forget how it was discovered, but it, oh, I know what it was. I put all the metal stuff in the little cup or the little bowl, and it went through the screening process, the screening machine, you know, the x-ray machine, and when it came out the other end, the guard said, I'm sorry, we're going to have to take these clippers, and you can either throw the clippers away, or we will take off the little file uh, that's in the clippers. You know the little file that's about an inch long that comes with little fingernail clippers? And I said, uh, all right, throw them away. So he threw them away. I got onto the airplane, and I took my briefcase, which had gone through the x-ray machine, and I was fishing around in there looking for a pencil or something, and lo and behold, I come across a real nail file. This one's about six inches long, and it's sitting in my briefcase and went through the x-ray machine, and yet somehow was not caught by the guards, but they caught my little one-inch file on the nail clippers. So I decided to leave that nail file in my briefcase and see what happens. I went through about eight security places before somebody finally spotted it and said, you're going to have to get rid of this. Oh, I feel so much safer with these people taking care of me. And I'm happy to say that I got an email from Tom in Colorado giving us the name of a government program that, as Tom says, seems to be working. And he's referring to the don't call list. And in case you don't know what that means, it means that there uh, you can... Tell the government that you want to be on a list of people whom telemarketers are not allowed to call. In other words, once you're on this government list, which they will never use for any other purpose, I'm telling you, then people like AT&T and uh, insurance companies and car salesmen and so forth and so on and so on cannot call you. Uh, they just simply cannot bother you. And Tom says that seems to have really cut down on the number of nuisance, call, nuisance calls, though I still get calls from charities, political groups, and even the phone company. Well, there you have it, Tom. Surprise, surprise, surprise. The don't call list is not absolute. The don't call list has all kinds of exceptions in it. And what I'll do at the news break is get out an article that Lou Rockwell wrote 
on this, and which gives all the details of how they managed to get this thing passed in such a way that it gives favored political friends the ability to now have a clear path. You don't get calls from people that don't have political influence, but you still continue to get calls from people that do have political influence, the people who can put the most pressure on the government. Now, what this means is that you will not get calls maybe from people whose wares you would like to know about, but you will get calls from people that you consider just pests. And the fact of the matter is that the free market had already figured out how to handle this. We have call caller ID, whereby... You can immediately see without picking up the phone uh, whether this is a call from somebody you know and uh, want to talk to or whether it's a call you just like to have your answering machine pick up on. And answering machines are another free market way people can defend themselves against calls they don't want. They can, as they say, screen calls just by waiting to see uh, who it is that's calling uh, by the answer, the message that they leave in the answering machine and then pick up or not pick up accordingly. There are other things that you can buy at places like Radio Shack and other telephone stores to help protect you from people you you don't want to talk to. So what we're doing is spending a few billion dollars at the federal level for a program that rewards political friends and punishes political enemies. No, I don't think this is a program that's working. But thank you for trying. Before we go back to the phones, I will continue with where we left off on the do not call scheme of the government. I really would call it the do not call scam. Llewellyn Rockwell calls it the do not call racket. And I mentioned before the break that the politicians had exempted their friends and are using this just to punish their enemies, meaning that their friends will have a clearer path to telemarketing now that they are not subjected to so much competition from other companies. And here's a, just one paragraph from Rockwell's article. Lou Rockwell wrote on July 5, 2003, quote, Here's the rub of the new legislation. The new government service only applies to the vacation sort of phone call. All the others are exempt. Nonprofits can call. Politicians can call. Big surprise. Long-distance carriers can call. So can any company you currently do business with you. Pardon me. So can any company you currently do business with. I don't know about you, but that pretty much sums up all the telemarketing calls I get. And he goes on and goes into a lot of detail about this. He is a wonderful writer who very often blows the whistle on government programs that we take for granted and just takes them apart and sees what makes them tick. Along with a number of other writers there, he usually uh, puts up about a dozen articles a day from various sources, including some of my articles. And I have talked with him, and he's told me that he finds all these articles himself. I don't know how he has the time to do so, but he has a wonderful selection. Uh, when I'm home, I usually read it every day. I wind up reading about half the articles that he has selected for the day, and there's usually two or three articles that I wind up saving. So let's go back to the phones and try not to keep anybody waiting too long. We're going to talk with James in Oregon. Good evening, James. Good evening, Harry. What's up? Um, point of contention, Harry. Uh, ah, good. <laughs> ah, know. some lively radio. Yeah, there you go. Um, I usually call in with a bone to pick. Um, well, I guess I should apologize if I come off too heavy-handed, as usual, um, beforehand. Um, having said that, um, your opening statement, um, you say nothing, no, no government program has ever worked, et cetera, et cetera. Um, essentially, um, the, the bone I have to pick is, is uh, the distinction between a libertarian and an anarchist. It's that an anarchist believes that nothing the government does or will do is any good, so throw the whole damn thing out. Um, a libertarian, however, does recognize that the government, by virtue of its very monopoly on the use of lethal force, does or is the only one that can implement certain programs, uh, in particular the administration of justice, for, for example. Um, when you open the show with your comments, um, I kind of got the feeling that an anarchist or somebody who knows what an anarchist is would, would pigeonhole you as an anarchist, because you're saying essentially that there is nothing that the government can do that, that actually works. Well, there are some government programs and I think you should qualify your statements, is what I'm saying, that there are some government programs that have to be done by the government. But are you saying that they work, that they deliver what they promise, or are you saying that you just can't think of any other way to do them? Uh, they have to be done by the government because they have to be done at the point of a gun. Okay, so, so you're not saying that they work well, you're just saying that you can't think of any other way that they can be done. That's correct. Well, um, it's not just that I can't think of any other way, it's just that you can't put it in the private sector because the private sector should never have the power of lethal force. Well, now, wait a minute. What you're saying is you don't know of any other way that it could be done than by having a monopoly of force in the hands of what we call government. That's and uh, and I'm not trying to put you down on that. I'm just trying to clarify and define what, what we're saying here. Sure. Yeah, okay, okay, but now, all right, let me, let me tell you something. First of all, we know that the government's way too big 
is you don't want the government to be $2.4 trillion. You want it to be a lot smaller, am I right? Uh, you're absolutely right. Okay, so we're not going to abolish government overnight. If Even if I were a bomb-throwing anarchist and I had an audience as big as Rush Limbaugh, we would not be abolishing the government overnight. Uh, what we're going to do is to aim, first of all, to get the government to live by the Constitution, because if the government did, we wouldn't need an income tax. If the government lived by the Constitution, we would be so much better off in so many different ways that people would come to realize what they have not learned in government schools, that government is not nearly as precious to them as individual liberty, Absolutely. and that the blessings of liberty are far, far greater than anything the government even promises. So at that point, we would expect people to begin to think of ways by which things that are constitutional could be done outside of government so that we could reduce government even further. And at that point, you would have people who are much better able than you or I to think of ways that systems could be developed by which things could be done that you or I can't imagine. And you say, because you've thought about this, you can't come up with any other way than through a monopoly of force to administer justice. Right. I don't know what the alternative to that is. All I know is that if we got down to the point where government were very, very small, and people recognize the blessings of liberty, there would be a lot of people in this country, people who have the brains, people who have the scientific knowledge, people who have the background, people who have the creativity to think of ways of handling things that are now considered to be absolutely essential to be handled by government. And when those ideas start coming on the market, people would sift through those ideas and maybe they would say, this doesn't make any sense to me at all, and look at another idea and say, my God, that's right, you could do it that way. I never thought of that before. I've thought about these things for 40 years, and that idea never never occurred to me. What a wonderful idea. What we need is to create the environment for that kind of creativity and not worry at this point whether the last speck of government can be eliminated because we don't have the ability to eliminate it at this point. So what difference does it make? If you have more to say, James, just hang on and we'll be back right after these words from our sponsors. We're talking with James in Oregon about the possibility of a world with or a society without government. And my point was that we are so far away from there that it makes no difference whether or not we can figure out how a, such a society would work. And if we ever got close enough to such a society that it really became an issue, at that point, all kinds of ideas would be spewing forth from people who have no interest in the subject now, all kinds of ideas about how things like the police function, the court function, the national defense function, and so on could be handled without government. And at that point, we could either accept these ideas or reject them. And if the ideas make no sense, or the ideas have... Uh, May make some sense, but to have flaws in them, then they're not going to be accepted and they're not going to happen in society. So to me, I see no point in people today arguing over whether or not a society could exist without any government at all. It just simply isn't necessary because it's not an issue at this, this point in history. And one other point that I want to make before I get back to James, and that is that the essential thing that we have to get across to people is that government doesn't work. That even though it is doing something you want it to do, like maintain a police force or maintain national defense or get rid of those bad guys in the Middle East or whatever it is, it isn't going to do it well. And unless people understand that, they will continue to propose programs that they think will make their lives better. They will continue to support programs uh, thrown out by George Bush or John Kerry or Newt Gingrich or uh, Bill Clinton or people like that because they will have the ring of plausibility about them. Yes, we need 100,000 more policemen on the streets. Wonderful idea, Bill Clinton. Yes, we should not leave any child behind. Wonderful idea, of George Bush, but none of these things are going to happen. And unless we get it across to people that government simply never delivers on its promises, then people are still going to fall prey uh, once in a while. Maybe not always, but once in a while to the politicians' blandishments. And James, pardon me for monopolizing the conversation, but it is my show, after all. <laughs> but go ahead and say what you want to say. Well, I'm uh, more concerned with the perception that libertarians are anarchists. I'm a libertarian. I am dead set against, uh, against anarchy. I'm not an anarchist. I'm proud to say I am not an anarchist. I'm a libertarian. Um, the fact is, uh, when I go to a libertarian party meeting, there are maybe uh, 40 to 50 percent of the attendees who are anarchists and who tell the newbies who walk in that libertarianism is, in fact, some form of anarchy. They're wrong. They're dead wrong. And when I convert people to libertarianism, the first thing I tell them is ignore the anarchists. Well, they're just wasting time by getting into that because, as I've said, there's no practical application of it today, so what's the point? Well, the, the thing is, uh, until and unless we can find a better way to stop crime than pointing a gun at a criminal and saying, here's the jail cell, there is a need for a monopoly on lethal force. Well, we don't even have to say that because there is a monopoly on force and it exists. But so it's not something we have to uphold. It's not something we have to support. It's not something we have to carry banners for but, because but, it's not in any danger of being taken away at this point. Well, uh, philosophically speaking, to convert people to libertarianism, you must at least um, tell them that there is, in fact, a function for the monopoly of force. 
until and unless we can find a better way to convince a criminal not to commit crime. Well, all you, have to, all you have to say, if you think it's necessary with a given individual, you can say, of course, I, ha I believe that we should have government police forces and the government army and so forth, but what I want to do is to get rid of all this other stuff, which uh, is just taking money away from us and throwing it down a rat hole. Oh, uh, social and political bold. It's right there in the libertarian oath. Well, yeah, the libertarian, exactly. Well, that's, that, that's fine, and, there, and uh, there's no problem with that. And if you run into anarchists at a libertarian meeting, all you have to say to them is, why are you bringing this up when we are so far away from uh, that being an issue that all you're doing is confusing things when what we really need to do right now is to reduce government to the absolute minimum. And if we achieve that, then you and I can argue endlessly about whether or not we should go any further from there. But until we get to that point, why do you keep bringing up this no government stuff? It's not that important. Well, the, the, the point is, people say, oh, libertarians, they're anarchists. Well, all you have to say is, I'm not, and I'm a libertarian, and then just and go out from there. Why, what's the difference, right? Well, you can say there may be some libertarians who believe that we could have a, world, a society without government, but I don't happen to be one of them, and I, most of the people I know don't believe that way. But what's really important is that you, meaning the person you're talking to, you and I agree that government is way too big, and what we have to do is to get busy and reduce it to the absolute minimum possible. I just don't think you need to make a big issue out of this, that it's unimportant. Wait until somebody else brings it up and then just point out that, well, I don't believe that way. You don't have to believe that way to be a libertarian, so let's get on with the task at hand, which is to reduce government to the absolute minimum. Well, you know, when, when I was on radio shows, uh, campaigning, uh, doing 8, 10, 12 shows a day during the presidential campaign of 2000 and also in 1996, whenever I would say to somebody on the phone, when they would get, want to p pick at something I had said or whatever, I would just say, look, you and I agree that government is way too big, and what we have to do is reduce it to the absolute minimum and then go i would go on from there nobody ever interrupted me and said no no i don't agree with that I, you know nobody ever argued with me over that and that is the point of agreement that you have with 70 percent of the people in this country right and that's the absolute minimum you said it yourself why didn't you say that at the beginning of the show that that, that government because i was a minimum? because i was talking about the fact that the that the answer to the problem of too much crime is more liberty the answer to the problem of health care is more liberty the answer to the problem of foreign policy is more liberty and so forth and uh, there is nothing in that that comes contradicts anything you've said or anything that I've said. Well, you said that nothing government does um, delivers, on its, delivers on its promises, and nobody yet has come up with anything. I do have another candidate that came in by email, which I hope to get to tonight. Oh, sure. But the point is that the police don't deliver on their promises. National Defense doesn't deliver on its promises. I still maintain that no government program delivers on its promises. Thanks for your call, James. Folks, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Don't go away. Before we go back to the phones, I just have to take this other... Uh, email I've received that deals with the question of what government programs work. Uh, we have a message from someone who must live in Florida. Uh, says a family member and I were discussing the fact that Florida would uh, would get federal disaster relief due to the hurricane. This family member brought up some good points that I couldn't refute. One, if there were no federal relief, would the states go bankrupt? And two, is it naive to believe that people will give enough to charity, not only in this case, but in other cases such as if there were no more government schools or if welfare were eliminated? I need help answering these questions. Why doesn't government work in this area? Besides the fact that the disaster relief is unconstitutional, a reason that I don't think would work with this family member. Well, the first point to make is that government is subsidizing people to live in unsafe areas. Now, I realize that people feel they have a right to live wherever they want and that if it's a dangerous area, then other people have a responsibility to pay for their ability to live in this dangerous area, whether it's dangerous from criminals or dangerous from the elements or whatever it may be. And therefore, uh, we are all obligated to send money to Florida. But the funny thing is that when there is a hurricane in Florida, the people in North Dakota and Minnesota and other places have to send money down to Florida. Then a little later in the year, a river overflows because of heavy rains in North Dakota and Minnesota, and people in Florida send a whole bunch of money up to North Dakota and Minnesota to bail out the people who are up there. And we are just crisscrossing money around the country, except for one very important thing. Very little of the money that we send to the federal government to send to these other places actually gets there. And my favorite example of this, which I mentioned on, this show, on my show earlier, the show I had on another network, is that in 1997, the Red River flooded parts of North Dakota and Minnesota. And, of course, no politician is going to be so heartless as to refuse to steal some money from you to help the poor people in North Dakota and Minnesota. Unfortunately, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, better known as FEMA, didn't have enough money to bail out the residents. So Congress passed the Emergency Supplemental Appropriations Bill to bail out FEMA. Now, here are some of the emergency items that were funded, mandated, or regulated in this bill, all of which were prompted by the need for relief from the Red River flood. Money went to the peacekeeping effort in Bosnia. Uh, that's in Europe, you know. Loans and grants for the college station area of Pulaski County, Arkansas. I don't think that's in North Dakota or Minnesota. 
Collection and Dissemination of Statistics on Cheese Manufacturing in the United States. Uh, money to Counter Terrorism at the 2002 Winter Olympic Games in, uh, where was that, Salt Lake City. Oh, Handling Marine Mammals Trapped in Fishing Equipment. Foreign Aid for the Ukraine. Uh, that's also not in the United States. I believe that's in Europe. Repairs of Concession Facilities at Yosemite National Park. And one of my very favorite programs is Importation of Polar Bear Parts from Canada. Oh, and there was a lovely, lovely item in there. For payment to Marisa, Sonia, and Frank Tejeda, children of Frank Tejeda, late a representative from the state of Texas, $133,600. Isn't that just special? So on and on it goes. I actually have here several pages of items, of which I have just given you a few of them. But the important thing is this. This bill covered money for virtually everything under the sun except for relief for the flood victims. So this great FEMA program that people think is so important that flood victims, hurricane victims, tornado victims can't do without really is just one more Christmas tree on which the politicians can hang ornaments for their political friends. The fact that a program is called Relief for Flood Victims or 100,000 New Cops on the Street or whatever it is is meaningless because all it is is a package in which the politicians can put their favorite program. Symbolism is everything. The president tours a disaster area and promises quick relief. Of course, in fact, the money may never arrive. And if it does even arrive, it's seldom quick. And it usually arrives long after the Red Cross has packed up and headed for the next disaster. But who's counting? It's not the money that matters. It's not even the thought that matters. It's the symbolic gesture that gets the votes. And a politician can make the gesture knowing that neither the press nor the opposition party will ever hold him accountable later for his empty promises. But on the other hand, anyone voting against the Emergency Supplemental Appropriations Bill of 1997 will seem to be heartless even though the bill is merely just a cover by which the politicians can distribute more of your money to influential companies, agencies, and individuals. Do not be deceived by government programs. They are never what they seem to be, and the Federal Emergency Management Association is no difference. Hurricane relief is no difference. And if we didn't have the federal programs, if we didn't have federal insurance, people might be a little more cautious about where they choose to live, and there might be more innovation in ways to protect people who do live in those areas from the elements. Innovation that doesn't seem necessary now or is too expensive merely because we know the government will bail us out, or we think it will. It's only when we're in trouble that we find out that the government really doesn't take care of us. We're going right back to the phones, but I do want to take one quick email. Banner in Maryland has emailed me and said, how can listeners send you money to continue your work? Well, it's very thoughtful of you, Banner, but please do not send any money. Uh, this is not the place to send money to. I am trying to do everything I do on a profit-seeking basis. I believe that in the final analysis, that's the best way to see what the market will bear, what people will respond to, and so my efforts are all on a paying basis and so it would be inappropriate to send me any money but if you want to help the cause of liberty I very strongly recommend that you think about sending money to either DownsizeDC.org and that's their website DownsizeDC.org and they could certainly use your help or to the Libertarian Party and they're at LP LP for Libertarian Party LP.org but thank you very much Banner for thinking of me I appreciate it but put the money where it's needed by people who do need to subsist on donations now let's go to Massachusetts and talk with Matthew good evening Matthew and my very great gratitude to you for waiting so long on the phone oh uh, how you doing Mr. Brown I'm just fine <laughs> I'm just throwing a few gray hairs here but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I uh, was just thinking about one of the wonderful government, not programs per se, but uh, new you know, laws that have come about uh, that have worked in the state of Massachusetts, uh, the great uh, socialist state of Massachusetts here. And I'm uh, not sure if you're familiar with our uh, gun laws, but um, they're some of the strictest in this, in this country. I can imagine. Yeah, and, uh, and I can t sure tell you that they've worked. Um, there's, there's definitely a government uh, law program, for that matter, that worked, and this one has sure worked in keeping... Uh, you know, law-abiding citizens from uh, owning their right, you know, you know, basically having the right to bear arms. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, the previous to about, I think it was 96, uh, when all you, all you had to do was go to apply for your, to uh, have your right to uh, bear arms uh, uh, allowed by the, by the state. Uh, now you have to uh, attend a class, um, which, you know, can be weeks on, weeks on end that not everyone can, can attend a class. Sure. And, um, and then after that, you have to... Go to your chief of police and fill out a form with an essay. Uh, you have to write an essay. You have to write an essay as to why you want to uh, carry carry an arm, or maybe carry a firearm, or or own a firearm. Um, 
door, and then you have to provide four photo photos of you. And um, and then that's pretty much it. And then if the chief of police, and this is not an exaggeration, if the chief of police doesn't like your the length of your hair or <laughs> your, and I'm not, actually not exaggerating, they don't have to have a reason to deny you. They right. just can deny you. Right. After, all, after all that, it doesn't matter. And all you can do is petition with the uh, state um you know, the state uh, court. And who's going to overrule the local police chief? No one. Yes. Uh, and so, so, it, so there's a government program or law that, that works. That keeps, uh, well, it works for the politicians, right. but it doesn't work for us because exactly. the statistics... I'm being facetious. No, I understand. <laughs> but the statistics show that more crimes are prevented by people, uh, citizens, civilians owning guns than right. by the police. Exactly. The police actually prevent very few crimes. They supposedly prevent crime by deterrence, meaning that the, uh, the existence of police deters people from committing crimes. But the actual interfering with a crime in progress comes much more from gun-owning individuals than it does from gun-owning policemen. So anything that discourages people from buying a gun and keeping one is, of course, promoting crime. It exactly. is encouraging crime. Exactly. And I, I really will have to have a program on liberty and crime. There are so many ways that government uh, encourages crime and more liberty would be a deterrence to crime that I'm going to have to do that and maybe we'll do it next Saturday night. And Because uh, uh, there, there really are so many ways and it is one of those areas where we just take it for granted that of course the more police we have, the more laws we have, the less crime there's going to be. But it is exactly the opposite exactly. and it isn't difficult to show it at all. And I, in, in Massachusetts, uh, especially the Boston area where it has even stricter local specifically local uh, gun laws to Boston, that kind of thing, has the highest rate of crime in Massachusetts. Yeah, that's so, interesting. That, it, it's very interesting. Is you, you, you know, it's these extremely strict gun laws, uh, and and there's music. Ah, there's music. <laughs> okay, Matthew, thank so you so much. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Have a very good evening. Thank you. I appreciate your call. But let's go right now to Dan in California and see what's on his mind. Good evening, Dan. Good evening, Harry. Good to hear from you. Oh, it's great to hear you on the radio. I'm so glad you're still out there. I, I was listening uh, tonight, and I noticed that, uh, a, a lot of what you said tonight had to do with the fact that government doesn't work. And, you know, when I first heard you say that, honestly, it didn't quite compute. And it's been, what, 1995 is the first time I heard you speak in San Diego. And, and I, I, you know, government just, you can force to get what you want, just does not work out. And I started thinking, you know, someone should write a, a book on why <laughs> government doesn't work. What an idea. <laughs> anyway, in case there's anybody listening that doesn't know it, Harry Brown wrote a book called Why Government Doesn't Work that explains what happens in the process, and really it's two words. Number one, politics. The process of politics takes whatever you want government to do and turns it into a big pile of you-know-what. <laughs> the other is bureaucracy. No matter the big pile of you-know-what they can pass, it's handed off to these bureaucracies that then use it for their own purpose and their own agenda. And what you could have accomplished through private means turns into the opposite of what you wanted. And why government doesn't work, I and Harry, is just fantastic. I just want everybody to remember that. Oh, thank you, Dan. And I'm sorry that uh, we put you on so late so that we're having to cut you off now with the final, final, final theme. But thank you very much for calling, Dan. If you have anything further to say, please call back next week. And you tune in next week, if you would, because we're going to be right back here, same time, same place. So have a good week in the meantime, and I look forward to talking with you next week. Good night. Thank you.